and I've, I've, I've shown how inconsistent they are with these various scripture passages. Mm. Um, so anyway, so yeah. that's, that's what this is all about. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Contra Talk. This is a show where we talk about things that matter. Uh, our guest today is a returning guest. He's been on the show several times, Gary DeMar. Uh, he's a husband and a father, a grandfather. He's an author of many books. He's been around a long, long time. He's taught in many different capacities all over the place, both in the United States and around the world. Uh, dealing with not just eschatology, although he's kind of become known for that, uh, but also Christian government and just understanding uh, the world from a biblical perspective. Uh, it's going to be a great conversation. We're hopefully going to talk about many uh, more hot buttony things or uh, things that have happened in the last uh, several months. And uh, yeah, it'll be a good show. Hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the show, Gary. How are you doing? Ed? I'm doing well. Yes. Good. 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 Just, just got off uh, surgery a couple weeks ago. And oh, wow. Recovering from that. So. What? Uh, was it back related or knee? or? I had a, a cancerous growth on my left calf. Oh, wow. And yeah. Yeah. It uh, kind of popped up. It probably, was probably there for a while, but it popped up in December. Uh, and about the size, yeah, about the size of almost the size of my, of, of my fist. Wow. And uh, I went through uh, radiation uh, therapy with it, five, five weeks of it. And then I had uh, on the 16th of March, I had it removed. And so I've been recovering from that. And it's been, it hasn't really been that bad at all. Okay. Uh, well, that's I'm, a praise. Wow. I didn't uh, know yeah. that. Okay. So anyway, praise but that's, God. I've been, yeah. been busy with that for the last few months. So anyway. Yeah. That'll occupy you for sure. Um, well, again, I t appreciate you taking the time. Uh, we'll get into some questions. I know we've talked several times before. I'll put those links in the description for the audience, uh, mostly about the end times. I know I've changed significantly, uh, partly because of you uh, and just really getting to the literature as being literal. Sometimes we see that. And that's one thing that you've said time and time again, uh, that we have to understand something based on the literature we're reading, right? Not just, well, Millennium says this in 2023, therefore this or, you know, soon or, or other words that we translate today. Well, you know, words mean different things like cool or green or gay. Those mean different things in different contexts. And so it's helpful. At least it's helped me. And I think it's helped many others as well. So if nothing we else, need, yeah, when we start talking about literal, oftentimes what we mean by that is physical and mm. literal means according to the literature. That's, that's what literal right. means. I mean, you read Shakespeare, there's all kinds of things in it. You read the Psalms, it's a different type of literature. Uh, Song of Solomon is a different type of literature. you got more historical narrative with, you know, uh, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, etc. Although there are different literary genres in, in those as well. So, right. um, and so a lot of people kind of throw the word literal around, but I think they mean something really quite different from what the word actually means when in terms of use. No, right. no one interprets the Bible absolutely literal. I don't even the person who claims he or she is interpreting the Bible literally really isn't doing it in terms of their their understanding of that. I mean, no. Right. I don't know anybody who believes there's a giant woman out in space right. somewhere who's you know can stand on the moon and have 12 stars as a crown and so forth mm. and yeah. dragons. And so every, everybody knows there's a lot of symbolic language as well. So anyway, right. that's. No, that's good. That's good to know um, for sure. Let's get into really the first couple questions that both have kind of accompanied um, conversations I've had and things that have come up in my, my own mind. Um, of course, Palm Sunday was uh, this last week. And um, looking at, of course, there's all sorts of prophecies that Jesus fulfills. It's, I, I forget what it is. It's 300, 400, something like that. You know, born of a woman, you know, crucified, the donkey, all of these. And of course, Zechariah 9.9 9, uh, is one that's great. I think it's helpful. Uh, maybe we can elaborate a little bit on this, but it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, the king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, the horse from Jerusalem, I will, uh, and the bow of war will be cut off. And he will speak peace to the nations and his dominion will be from sea to sea and from river 
and from the river of the ends of the earth. Uh, it goes on speaking about covenants and, and things. Uh, real quick, I mean, I think anybody can see that and say, well, that's that happened right on Palm Sunday, right? When the Passover was Thursday, the Good Friday, Jesus is crucified, and a couple days later, he rises from the dead that next Sunday. Um, so what, I guess sometimes people get uh, kind of, you know, the old Christmas passage too. the government will rest on his shoulders. You know, we'll call him wonderful counselor, mighty God. The government will rest on his shoulders. And we kind of and I've always heard this. and I think a lot of people do. Well, that's that's different. That's splitting here. No one would read Zechariah 9, 9, I, I would say, humble and mounted on a donkey. We would all say, yeah, that already happened. Right. I think we would all agree with that. You'd say. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was, yeah. we see that in, in uh, Matthew chapter 21, where this is this is right. brought up. And this, I think this is one of the this is one of the things that uh, probably upset the, 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 the Jews of the day, the religious leaders of the day, because their idea of a Messiah was not somebody coming in on a donkey. Right. They were looking for somebody with a much more pageantry than than that. And this this right. guy's this guy's the Messiah. He's going to save us. And in reality, you know, he's 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 a very hum very humble, and his task is to redeem in a way that he 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 promised. All you know, back in Luke's Luke's gospel, mm -hmm. he was going to bring salvation to you know to Israel, and he had to do that through a particular way, and it meant that, that way was you know to the to the cross. Right, and I think that was the sticking point for a lot of a lot of Jews, uh, and you notice that the people who are really praising him are the are the common people, the people who attacked who attacked Jesus and brought him before Pilate and brought him through um, and, and brought him through Herod to Herod were uh, the religious leaders, right? Uh, and they and if you notice they they kept switching the arguments. Mm. From one to another, you know, we finally get to Pilate. It's political arguments used against Jesus. Uh, but uh, they, you know, were they were they throwing Jesus out there to force him to say, yes, yes, I'm really that guy. And here I am. And I'm you know, going to be like Clark Kent. He's going to open, you know, <laughs> turn his tear, you know, his shirt off and, and to proclaim himself to be the Messiah and take and take uh, and take Rome down. Uh, so you know, th there was just this that tension remained, I think, all the way through mm -hmm. to get into the book of Acts, you know, the 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 debate in the book of Acts, the, the real antagonists in the book of Acts were not the Romans. They were the they were Jews who rejected Jesus as the promised Messiah and who had who was getting rid of the whole old covenant. Right. Uh, and that was something they just could not tolerate. They it was OK that you could believe in Jesus, but you couldn't believe in you could you could believe in Jesus, but you couldn't. You The, the Gentiles could also believe in Jesus. But the two could not be one. The Jews were still very special people. Uh, they were set apart. Gentiles were, you know, part of the nations. They were they were different, and so salvation was different for each one of those groups. And Jesus says, "No, that's just not the case." And again, you can see that very early on, especially in Luke's gospel. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, so we would all say Zechariah nine nine, absolutely, it's already happened. And I think that's kind of the big difference. And I know you've. You've even said it to me. You don't like the terms of millennial because it kind of gets hung up on pre-millennial, post-millennial, amillennial. And well, it's a thousand years or it isn't or it's this time or we're already there, et cetera. Whereas there's more this uh, futurist, you know, I, I guess there's partial futurist and then there's preterist and partial preterist. And so there's these prophecies because we see in the Old, Old Testament and New Testament, there's all sorts of prophecies like this one right here. But this was already there in Jesus's time, like you're saying, and they're upset that Jesus is coming in on a donkey. And yet this has already now happened. This is already now in our past, right? So it's Zechariah's audience is in the future. In our time, it's in the past. Well, you know, a lot of people get hung up on Matthew 24 uh, or, or Ju uh, uh, Luke 21 or the book of Revelation. When was that written? Is he talking about a future third temple or not? Well, if you're looking at it earlier, then he's talking about his future still, which would be likely in the you know, mid to late 60s. I would think, uh, at least from what I understand, versus, you know, the 90s speaking about 2000 years in the future still. So I guess the second question or the part of this is verse 10, though, it says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, the house from Jerusalem, the horse from Jerusalem, excuse me, the bow of war will be cut off and he will speak peace to the nations. OK, I think it sounds good. And his dominion will be from sea to sea. So pump the brakes right there. What's going on? 
in a verse like that, similar to the Christmas passage, like I just said, the government will rest on his shoulders. We look around and we say, Jesus isn't king. He's not president. He's not prime minister. What's going on? How is this, you know, he's wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father. Yes. And then wait. Oh, that's in the future. And I can't tell you how many times I heard that, usually from a premillennial dispensational um, believers. So can you flesh that out and maybe the second passage too from Isaiah there? Well, I, I, you know, the, it's the nature of the kingdom. I mean, it's, you know, Jesus says his kingdom is not of this world. Now, he wasn't saying his kingdom didn't operate down here. Mm -hmm. it, 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 did not, it, it, it did not manifest itself or draw its power from armaments and, and so forth. I mean, he even said to Pontius Pilate, man, if I wanted to, I could, I could, I could call a, a cohort of, of, of my servants to, you know, to take you out. That, right. isn't, that isn't the nature of, of the kingdom. The Christianity is the only inside out religion. It, it, it changes people from the inside out, not from the outside in. All the other religions of the world are typically, some of the Eastern religions are inside out, but there's, there's no transformation that takes place. There's no power outside the individual. That, in, that, that power resides within the individual, independent of anything on the outside. Hmm. With Christianity, this transformation takes place on the inside as the Holy Spirit comes in and changes our hearts and our minds and changes, therefore, our hands and what we do. Uh, and I think that's, you have to understand that this idea of, of the kingdom, I mean, John the Baptist said the kingdom, you know, the kingdom of God is at hand. Yeah. Unless you say, well, it was, it was at hand and now it's been postponed, but there's no indication that that's, that's the case. The whole point of Jesus coming was to, to go to Jerusalem, to go up to Jerusalem. He had to pay the penalty for, for sins. He had to renew things uh, like, like they, they, they were at the beginning. There had to be a sacrifice and so forth. And there's no indication from that that Jesus was, you know, after that was now going to set up some sort of earthly, uh, you know, kingdom. That's what the dispensationalists say. Oh, the Jews rejected Jesus as the promised Messiah. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the prophetic clock has stopped. But that's just not true. The Jews did not reject Jesus as the promised Messiah. The people who showed up at his trials were, were the religious leaders. Mm -hmm. And the, the people who were at Pentecost were Jews, Jews uh, living in Jerusalem from every nation under seven, uh, under, under heaven. And this was at um, uh, chapter, chapter two, verse five. Right. So Pentecost, which, again, was this wasn't this wasn't something that was spontaneous. This was a plan. This was a planned deal. This was what was supposed to happen. And so there are Jews living in Jerusalem from every nation under heaven. The Holy Spirit is poured out on them and they and they're transformed the whole nature of the kingdom is transformed the way it way it operates they, you go back to chapter one they're still looking for this this physical kingdom is, is this is this now the time you're going to restore israel to the kingdom and jesus jesus says look stay in jerusalem when you stay in jerusalem you will see power from on high mm -hmm. that was his answer to that it it, it, it wasn't this idea that somehow this earthly kingdom was going to be established and Jesus was going to reign, you know, physically from, from Jerusalem. That's, that's just not the case. Uh, and we've got this idea that God does everything for us. You know, if you, if, 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 if you want something, if you want something done, God has to actually personally intervene to make it happen. Mm. So God has equipped us to, to, to make these changes, to, 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 to fix these things. It's always been that way. We're, we're on the responsibility side of, the, of, of his kingdom. Hmm. And unfortunately, we don't operate in those terms. We, we have this post, we're still stuck in this postponement idea that we're waiting for some giant cataclysm to come, uh, typically in millennial terms, where Jesus is going to come, he's going to destroy all of his enemies, he's going to set up a millennial kingdom, he's going to do that on earth for a thousand years. But that's still, that's still not the end of things for them. Because then they say at the end of that, there's going to be this great rebellion that's going to come. And then Jesus is going to put down Satan again. Uh, you know, like he didn't do that the first time around. Uh, he defeated, and Satan is a creature. It's not like he was a competing God, even mm -hmm. though 2 Corinthians 4 talks about he's the God of, the God of this age. Mm -hmm. in, in, in this sense, that the, the unbelieving Jews, they were blinded by the, blinded because they were looking for something different in terms of what it meant for the kingdom. Satan had blinded them, but Satan was, was defeated. He was defeated at the cross. He was continually wiped out during this, this period of time. 
That's why the gospel was going out to the nations and the nations were believing. Uh, Romans 16, 20 said, God will soon crush Satan under your feet. Mm -hmm. But we've, we have this idea that Satan is still all going around, you know, controlling everything. And I just, I just think that's a huge, huge mistake. We're still waiting for some cataclysmic event to, to break into history and to fix everything where God has called us to be responsible agents in terms of he's already, already given us everything we need in order to do it. We just need, in fact, we just need them to go out and do it. Gotcha. So, so back up just slightly. Um, you would say, I mean, Satan's still active, but he's not in control. Like yeah, you're saying, you I like don't know. You know that's he's a big been thrown I, down. I don't know if he's active. You know, if you read the book of James, he, he doesn't attribute anything to this to Satan. He says, you're the problem. You're yeah. carried away by your own lusts. The reason yeah. you're you're at war with one another, you're the problem with that. We, we you know some of your audience is probably too young, but you know Flip, Flip Wilson, you know, had this character Geraldine, and uh, you know the the devil made me do it. Anytime something went wrong, Geraldine would say the devil made me do it. Well, see, we said we blame right. everything on the devil, and we we see what's taking place in our culture today that it's it's satanic. It's saint it's satanic in the sense that it's adversarial mm -hmm. uh, it, it, and people left of themselves. And, you know, uh, I've, I've been reading this book by, I'm going to pick it up here. It's by Erwin Lutzer. Oh, and yeah. let's see here. Uh, when a nation forgets God. Yeah. And uh, this is a, this is a terrific little book. And it's interesting is, is that Lutzer is, is a, Kind of an end time guy. He talks a lot about Bible prophecy, but in this the first chapter here, he talks about what happened in Nazi Germany, and the things that, that happened in Nazi Germany. The church became very quiet, quietistic, very pietistic. Mm -hmm. He tells one particular story of somebody who survived World War II, and a church uh, that was near a uh, near the railroad tracks. And they would they would hear they would hear the, the 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 train coming down the track, and there were they would hear screams from the train, and they knew they knew what was going on. They as as, as that train passed, and they heard these screams that were that were coming out of there. They knew what was going on, and their remedy to that was to sing these hymns louder, to the to muffle to silence the screams, and look. This is all going on around us today. There are screams happening all over, the, all over the place. We saw just up in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, you know what what happened with with the transgender a woman coming in to the church and shooting and, and, and shooting it up. And uh, this is so okay. So church, what are you going to do? What's what? What are you going to do here? Uh, we, we see what's happening politically. We see what happening. It's happening socially. The Christians don't seem to be active in terms of trying to change all of that. Yeah. And I'm not saying government is the solution to all that. Uh, but cr Christians need to understand that we are in a war. We've always been in a war and we've typically, we've won those wars, uh, not with bullets and so forth, but with worldview, with application of the gospel to every area of life. E England got rid of slavery, the slave trade without a war here mm -hmm. in the United States. You know, if Christians had stood up and said, you know, if slavery was, uh, was uh, is uh, unbiblical. It's 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 a moral evil. We we could have we could have stopped it without without a war. So Christians have have developed this sacred secular division, and this is something that Lutzer brings up in this in this chapter. We see you see how uh, uh, you, you find Hitler going to the churches and accommodating the churches and saying you know, we're, we're doing positive Christianity, and the people fell for it. And over time, of course, they silenced the silenced the churches. They would go in. The Gestapo would go into churches and monitor sermons. This is look, this is happening. It's happening in England and some other countries. Pastor gets up in the church and starts preaching against homosexuality and so forth. They they can be arrested for it. Yeah. Now that's possible. That's going to happen here in the United States if we don't get our our act together. It doesn't mean the rapture's right around the corner. It's just that we may go through a period of dark ages. Uh, that you know that destroys you know m many of the nations of the world today as a result of all this yeah but the unbelieving thought as it becomes consistent with itself is self-destructive you, you know we, we got the, we got the unbelievers who are killing their killing their future through abortion you got people literally mutilating themselves 
in terms of their ability to, to engage in, in sex, uh, they're preoccupied with it. Uh, and you, you know, homosexuality and transgenderism and so forth. This is, and people decided not to have children. Mm -hmm. You just can't wait to that, to they self-destruct. You have to build, you have to build while, while their worldview is beginning to fall apart. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that I try and I try it almost every, every chance I get <laughs> either from the pulpit or from this platform or whatever, just, we need to build. We need to, even if it's, I mean, I was outside for the last few hours with my wife finishing a chicken coop and we built it with a bunch of material I got from people at uh, church, some free plywood and things like that, trying to stay on a budget. We've got the chickens already and they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but they need a bigger spot. And we built a little nest box and everything like that. And it's, you know, it's little stuff, but my great grandparents no doubt had chickens. At least some of them did. And being more self-reliant, being more, uh, in tune as it will, as it were with just stuff around you and physically building like, you know, why not, you know, as opposed to relying always on all these other things, whether it's even basic things like food or electricity or other stuff that I think a lot of people, you know, a terrorist attack or something like that power grid goes down or something basic that we think like you're, like you said earlier, there's, there's such this, like we're waiting with bated breath. Oh, this is going to happen. This is Obama's the Antichrist. The Pope's the Antichrist. Biden's the Antichrist. Trump's the Antichrist. You know, whatever. And it's like, okay, so what though? And I guess maybe we could talk about that a little bit, but I've always been confused with, sometimes it's like the, the dispensationalists will say, well, this is happening. You know, the third temple, this and that. Okay, fine. Let's go with that for a moment. But I thought, this guy said over here that nothing has to happen until the rapture. Now, can you straighten that out for us? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a very good point. All the all the best selling prophecy books look at current events and they maintain that based upon what we're seeing in the world today, the rapture must be right around the corner. But if you really study dispensational theology, uh, the dispensationalists will say, no, no, no. Uh, there are no signs leading up to the, the, the rapture of the church. It's a signless event because it could happen any time. If you say, well, the temple has to be rebuilt or this person needs to be in power or, or uh, this nation, there needs to be a, 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 a 10 nation common market. If you say all of those things have to be in place before the rapture takes place, then the rapture is no longer a signless event because according to them, the rapture could have taken place for any, any time in the last 2000 years. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, but you can't sell books. Well, you can't sell books <laughs> and get people excited yeah. about something that doesn't yeah. have any signs because you can't point to anything empirically that says we're living in the last days. Yeah. And of course, I think the whole dispensational system is just completely fabricated from, you know, from, from day one. And I know a lot of people say, I just can't, you, know, you can't believe that you're saying that. I mean, we, they've, you go back. I mean, all you have to do is go back, let's see, um, 50, 53 years to uh, Hal Lindsey's late great planet Earth, mm -hmm. uh, 1970, it came out. And he and he, he said, uh, I think on the original hardback edition, it's page 54, 53 or 54, he talks about Israel becoming a nation again was the significant sign. Mm -hmm. Well, again, Israel becoming a nation again, according to the dispensational system, can't be a, 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 a sign because there are no signs for it. And right. No signs for the rapture. But they maintained that, you know, then he went to Matthew 24, verse 34, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So the generation was 40 years. You had 40 to 1948, Israel became a nation. You get 1988. So there was a big push during the, the 1970s that the 1980s was what Hal Lindsey said was the terminal uh, generation. Now, it's interesting, there is this new film out on the Jesus Revolution uh, that Chuck Smith, uh, uh, Lonnie Frisbee, um, um, I forget who's the, who the other fellow oh, is. Greg, Greg Laurie. Greg Laurie. If you go, if you go back and, and, you, and you study that era, you will note that it, it was steeped in end-time predictive uh, yeah. eschatology. They were using the same arguments that we hear today way back then, leading up to events uh, regarding the, the coming of Jesus within, within that, that generation. I mean, um, you know, Chuck Smith, Chuck Smith made this prediction for the 1980s about Halley's Comet 
Halley's Comet came and how it was going to be all through this destruction based upon Revelation chapter 6. And I, I've got all the literature on it. I've written extensively on Chuck Smith's view. And it was the same thing. You know, Hal Lindsey, 1948, 1988. Uh, you had Tim LaHaye uh, started. He said that that generation started in 1917. Uh, of course, as time ran out on what a generation was, he changed it to 19, 1948 and then 1967. And these guys just continue to pump out this stuff. And I believe it's debilitating. I think lots of Christians younger Christians who come in and they hear it for the very first time and they think, oh, this is something new and someone has a someone has a handle on all this. Well, they don't have a handle on it. They never did have a handle on it. And they've been wrong so often and yet they're, they're, they're still out there pushing. They did a new a new version of the Left Behind film. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I've, I've talked to, to, uh, to Kirk Cameron who, was, who starred in the, in, the, in the first one and he's kind of embarrassed you buy that he's completely changed his eschatological you know position on all of yeah this. i remember you it, saying that so he yeah, he's no longer because he was pre-millennial dispensationalist like, right. like a lot of other people. And, and if you and if you watch his stuff today you'll see the difference he's mm -hmm. out there forcing the antithesis he's out there going directly into the into the mouth of the beast going into these libraries <laughs> and getting you know getting to read one of his his books and then this, they, they, I think 40 or 50 of them denied it. Well, he just kept pushing, yeah. kept pushing on it. And eventually you know, hundreds and hundreds of people showed up uh, for this. In fact, one particular case, I think a librarian was, was fired because of the way that he, he was treated. This is what you have to do with, with all of this. But if you sit back and say, oh, woe is us. Um, you, know, we, you know, we're living in the last days. This is all prophetically, prophetically laid out. There's nothing we could do even if we wanted to get involved. But, you know, Kirk Cameron's eschatology changed. And as a result of that, he ended up effectively making changes in the world. And I'm not saying that people who hold to a different eschatology aren't productive in terms of, of the world. Tim LaHaye is a good example of that. Yeah. I mean, Tim LaHaye, uh, he and I were on the you know, opposite ends of the prophetic uh, spectrum. I wrote a book called Left Behind, Separating Fact from Fiction. But he, he was involved. His wife was involved, Concerned Women of America. Uh, Tim, Tim LaHaye was involved and, and so forth. But they could, it was, eschatology for them was a stillbirth. They could only get so far with it because it was, they, they knew that there was a prophetic inevitability here and there's only, they could only go so far. Uh, so th this, is, this is where we are as a, as, as a culture today. Uh, and, and that's it's it's unfortunate that that's where we are. Francis Schaeffer was the same way. I mean, Francis Schaeffer came on the scene again. I don't know if your audience knows who who he was, but he was out there at a film know. series I, I and lecture. Yeah. yeah, and he was out there. But see, he could only go so far with it because he was a premillennialist. And then so he writes a book, um, which you know dealt with the only way you could you could you could uh, I think it was called the Christian Manifesto. The only way you could defeat this was through Christian resistance uh, and not 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 applicational Christianity to go into every area of life and transform it from the inside out, but actually just be on the defensive in terms of what's coming. There's, yeah. You know, you can't you can't win. Can't win if you're only on defense. All it takes right. is for the other side to get <laughs> score one point and you lose. Yeah, um, I guess. And not to to camp too much on the dispensational. Um, but why, why is there, so one camp says, Hey, the rapture can happen. It's a signless event, but then other people who want to sell books, it seems like want to, wow, there's this, there's this, there's this, there's this, look at all these other things. Look at this thing. Um, you know, the, the, the embassies back in, in, in Jerusalem, it was in what Tel Aviv or whatever. Uh, you know, it's like, okay. Uh, but it, why a third temple and things like that? Is that because they read Revelation and they see a temple there and they believe that Revelation was written later, therefore it can't refer to the second temple that was destroyed in AD 70? Well, they, you know, and they will admit there's not a single verse in the New Testament that says anything about a rebuilt temple. Um, the dispensationalist system is a little complicated uh, because they take Daniel 70 weeks, 490 years, and they take it up to the very last week. So you got that last week, uh, this last seven years, they don't know what to do with. And so what they've done is they put, they cut it off from the other 69 weeks from the other 483 years. Mm -hmm. And every second of the clock that ticks is pushing that 70th week into the, into the future. 
And that's when, of course, the temple is supposed to be rebuilt because they need a rebuilt temple. They need it. They right. need it. They need a place for the Antichrist to, to, to do his thing. Uh, they need they need uh, um, uh, some sort of um, uh, idol to be put in, in in it. This is all based. This is all based on Daniel nine, mm. uh, verses twenty four through twenty seven. But if you read Daniel nine twenty four through twenty seven, you won't find anything in there. Nothing about an antichrist mentioned there. Yeah. There's no place in Scripture where you're given a certain number of years or days, and there's a gap between them that all of a sudden you know you someone says this is going to happen in, in three days. And that the two days pass, and then there's a break, and then finally the third year com comes up. Seventy years of captivity. They were in captivity for 70 years. What if God had postponed the last year and, and just kept pushing it in the future? Right. And God said, oh, I'm not, counting, I'm not counting this gap in between 70 years, but I'm not counting the gap. I mean, it's really a messed up system. And it's, it's you know, you can always go, is there a New Testament verse that says the temple is going to be rebuilt? No. Is there an Old Testament verse that says the temple is going to be built? Yes. Was the temple rebuilt? Yes. Uh, is uh, the Antichrist? You talk to people about the Antichrist, and you ask them, "Give me a biblical definition of Antichrist." Mm -hmm. And I, I've seen whole books on the Antichrist where they mo almost never actually quote the verses where the word Antichrist is used, which is kind of troubling. But they see the Antichrist on every uh, on every page. But a simple definition of, of the Antichrist is a biblical definition is. Someone who denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. That's the biblical definition. It's not a political figure. It's a religious figure. Yeah. And there were many antichrists. And John says this, this is even evidence that, you know, that it's the, um, it's the, 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 end, the end is near. We're, we're living, you know, the day and the hour. It's, it's, it's right around the corner. And he was mm -hmm. talking about the unbelieving Jews. They were the first century antichrist. They, den they had denied that Jesus Christ had come in the flesh. They denied that he was the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, they were the problem. They were the antichrists. Today, they make it into some political figure. But that's it just it goes completely against what the Bible says about all these things. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, we could go on and on. A lot of this we have talked about. And you've you've written even more uh, over the years. And of course, AmericanVision.org is a great resource. Uh, anybody can check out. There's lots of small books, big books. And uh, we'll I'll get some recommendations there at the end uh, from you as well. But Recently, uh, there's been some, and I've not followed it too closely. I've had a few people ask me, "Hey, did you see about Gary Demar? This thing and that thing. And he's he's now he's he might be a heretic now, or it's, there's just kind of this dust up." And I know, of course, you and Doug Wilson go back way 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 back, and um, and the guys there in Moscow and, and other places as well. And uh, can you just kind of flesh out exactly uh, what what's what's happened uh, and and where if you've changed from a partial preterist to a preterist view and and what you think, you know, something about like the Apostles Creed, right, that Jesus, you know, will, will come in the flesh again, that, that sort of thing, or even in Acts one, for example, uh, flesh that out for us and, and look at. Uh, explain <laughs> even for me because like i said i haven't followed it too closely yeah and what I, and this isn't anything new i my my questions about eschatology go back well they go back a long way but on this particular case they go back 25 years in 1998 i was asking the same questions i'm asking today and people generally ignored those what i was what i was asking uh, and what i'm trying to do is to get uh people to be consistent uh, and just explain what a preterist is. A preterist is a preterist is someone who claims that a particular prophecy has been fulfilled, and so it is in the its fulfillment is in the past. Uh, if if you believe that the prophecies under the old on the old covenant were fulfilled in the new covenant, you're a preterist. Mm -hmm. Those those were prophecies. They are now fulfilled. Their the fulfillment is in our past. That makes you a preterist. Well, in the New Testament, there are lots of prophecies that were given in the New Testament that were fulfilled already. Uh, you mentioned Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 34 says, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Mm -hmm. and, and I, uh, Doug Wilson, uh, Ken Gentry, uh, and, and, and many others uh, believe, uh, Jeff Durbin, James White, believe that those passages refer to events leading up to and including the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. We all agree with that. Yeah. Now, the, 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 the problem is when you, when you study the, 
um, when you study the um, the Apostles' Creed, and if I could, I don't know if I could pull this up here or not. Uh, yeah, here we go. Here's a nice. This is the Nicene Creed. See if I can find it here. Okay. It says, and he sit, sits on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead. So he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead. The, Newton, the Nicene Creed says the, the quick and the dead. Yeah. And, the, and the Apostles' Creed says the same thing. Right. Now, here's, here's the problem. The partial preterists... Uh, Ken Gentry and the rest of those guys would say Jesus came in the first century in judgment in the lead up to and including the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. So they considered that a coming. In fact, that's the word that's used in Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. Right. Jesus will come on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That says Jesus is, is, was coming. And which parallels the destruction of the first temple, right, with Babylon and all that. Is that is that correct? Well, the the a lot of the language that was used language. in the Old Testament, which talked which talked about the destruction of Babylon, uh, Edom, uh, Egypt, and so forth. Jesus appropriates that language and applies it to what I believe and others believe is that Jerusalem had become New Testament Babylon. Right. And he, he, he quotes, if you go look at ch uh, verses twenty nine. Uh, I think you have 29 and 28 and 29, uh, you will find actually seven, 27, 28, 29, you will find Jesus quoting Old Testament passages uh, that were uh, found in Isaiah chapter um, 13. And I think Isaiah, I'd see the 24, 26. I can't, I can't remember. Jesus okay. takes those and he says, this is, this is what's going to happen to the temple. Remember, Jesus said, not one stone here is going to be left upon another, but all be torn down. So you've got that coming, and the actual that is the actual word that's used, coming. And so now, so the, the partial preterists will come along and say, well, there's going to be a second coming, although the New Testament doesn't say anything about a second coming. Uh, Ac, uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28 talks about he will come a second time. The first time he came was because of sin. But the second time he comes isn't going to be because of sin, because he already took care of that. And so if that's the second time, is that the second coming? But co the coming of Jesus in AD 70 was a coming. And if Jesus' incarnation is the coming, you've got, you got the incarnation is the coming. You have Jesus' destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 as a coming, Matthew, 20, Matthew 24, 30. Mm -hmm. So now there's supposed to be another coming. But, the, but all, all the, the Nicene Creed says here, and he shall come again, hmm. and with glory to judge both the quick and the dead. Well, you, if you look at Matthew chapter uh, Matthew chapter 26, let me, let me read it to you because I think it's important to get the, the exact language on this. Um, Matthew 16. It says, for the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father. Okay, what does it say here? Nicene Creed says he shall come again with glory. So Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, for the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father uh, with his angels and will then recompense every man according to his deeds. So let me go back and read this again. He shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead. Uh, then it goes on. Truly, I say to you, now this is Jesus. This is uh, this is Jesus speaking to that audience, that generation. Truly, I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who shall not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Well, all these guys, uh, Ken Gentry, Jeff Durbin, Doug Wilson, they believe this particular passage refers not to the second coming, but refers to the coming. In judgment that Jesus explains in, in Matthew chapter 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, if you look at verse 27, the unfortunately, the English translation here doesn't get it. It says, for the Son of Man is about to come in the glory of his Father. The Greek word mellow is there. So, so these guys, and I believe this, this passage, these two verses in Matthew 16, refer to the 
coming of Jesus in judgment against Jerusalem in AD 70, where he judges Jerusalem. And later on, if you read Acts chapter 17, verse 31, he begins his judgment of the nations. All right. So we all agree with this. Now, the question is, okay, so what passages actually refer to what we say is this are this is the second coming and this is this separate is where, from ad 70 you're saying from, right? different from ad 70 okay. you know second coming uppercase s uppercase c mm -hmm. what give me the passages that refer to that coming and why doesn't the nicene creed and the apostles creed make a distinction between these two comings and i think one of the reasons why they don't make a distinction because they didn't see a distinction back in the fourth century as we've studied this through the, through the centuries, literally through the centuries, you will see that people began to see that, oh, well, these passages refer to the destruction of Jerusalem at AD 70. Here are some of the greatest commentators, you know, who ever lived who hold that position. You got, you know, Adam Clark and John Gill and Nehemiah Nisbet, uh, John Lightfoot, John Owen, John Brown. You got, you got all of these guys. I've got, I've got books in my library going back hundreds of years, which show that these particular passages refer to the judgment coming of, of, of Jesus in, with the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. So now, which, which passages refer to the, the so-called second coming? And that's, that's the rub, because mm. when I, if, I take a group, if I take a group of these guys and put them together, they disagree on which passages refer to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, and which ones apply to what we call the second coming? I'll give you a good example, um, and and I'll let your I'll let your listeners, your viewers, when I read this, tell me what this sounds like. Revelation one seven, behold, he is coming, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Even so, amen. Now listen to what that says. Every eye will see him. Now we're told that the, the second coming is he's going to return visibly. Mm -hmm. According to this passage, that's exactly what this says. Every eye is going to see him. So does that sound like a second coming passage? Yeah, yeah I would. I, my guess is if we went outside a typical church and we pulled that verse out, they would say, that, that that is a second coming passage. Yeah. And they sure. would also say that Matthew 24, 30 is a second coming passage. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Westminster Confession of Faith uses question number 56, uses Matthew 24, 30 as a second coming passage. But Ken Gentry doesn't interpret this as a second coming passage. He interprets Revelation 1 7 as related to events leading up to and including the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Yeah. And Phil Kaiser, for example, Phil Kaiser takes 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, uh, 13 through 18, and he says, no, 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 that doesn't refer to the second coming. He, he says that refers to events leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. I, I could go on with all the inconsistencies among these guys on various passages. Hmm. Uh, Ken Gentry believes that um, uh, 2 Peter 3, the new heavens and the new earth, being burned up and so forth refers to a literal burning up of the of the, the heavens and the earth in the in the future. Doug Wilson doesn't agree with that, and a lot of other people don't either. What I'm trying to do is to get is is to point this out to people. We need to we need to straighten this out. And of course, what's happened is a lot of these guys don't want me to do the questioning of this because <laughs> they will then have to straighten it out. Mm. And they have all kinds of ways of getting around it by saying, well, this is what the church has always believed. Well, they're pointing to the Nicene and, 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 uh, and the Apostles' Creed. We don't even know who wrote the Apostles' Creed. And yeah. there's a problem there. It, we, there they, it makes no distinction between the AD 70 coming of Jesus and the, uh, what we call the second coming. Uh, so I, I've, been, I've been needling them for the longest time about this because I've been getting these same types of questions for 25 years. And people keep asking me these questions. Like, Gary, how do I make a distinction between these two? Yeah. Ken Gentry says this. You know, Phil Kaiser says this. Doug Wilson says this. Um, you know, and what, 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 you know, what Milton Terry says this about Acts chapter one, verse, verse 11. Uh, and, and everybody loves Milton Terry. Dispensationalists love Milton Terry. Ken Gentry loves Milton Terry. 
I'm trying to get them to be consistent with this. Yeah. And, uh, and as a result of this, their, their argument against me is, well, you asking these types of questions and suggesting that there may be a problem with all of this makes you something of a heretic. Uh, yeah. and, and the thing is, the thing is, Richard, the, the hermeneutical methodology that I've used in all of my books on Bible prophecy that everybody seemed to love, all of these guys seem to love, the same hermeneutical methodology that I'm using in those books, I'm applying it, trying to apply it consistently throughout the New Testament. Mm. And <laughs> they see this as a disruption in the force. And, yeah. and, and, and as a result, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm being deplatformed or at least talk about being deplatformed. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I graciously bowed out of a conference on eschatology in Texas because this thing became, became an issue. Um, and I, look, I can't help but ask, ask these questions. I can't help in, in trying to be honest, honest with the text. Yeah. Uh, they, they could help by giving me some, you know, come on, this, give me, give me the verse. I, I've said this, give me the verse, the verse that says that supports unequivocally un, un, con, con, uh, uncontestable um, uh, without any debate that, that deals with specifically with what we call the second coming and all the elements to it. I've mm -hmm. asked them and they said, well, you know, you, you could use this verse, you could use that verse. And I come back and say, well, so-and-so uses this verse and that verse and use it for something else. So that's, that, that's it in a nutshell. Gotcha. Um, and so they want me just to affirm, you know, uh, they sent me three questions and they, I have to affirm these. And if I don't affirm them, then I'm a heretic. Uh, mm -hmm. But if I affirm them, I'm right back to where I started. I'm still asking questions about all of this stuff and it's, it, and it's, it's not going to go away. And I would, People would say, well, re the only reason Gary's affirming these questions is because we'll get off his back, and but he's still he's still asking the same questions for <laughs> everybody. That's that's yeah. the reality of all this. Gotcha. So, so you, yeah, that was one of the really questions. The first, I want to add. the first person that I've publicly uh, discussed this with. Now, Doug, Doug Wilson is the only person out of a group of guys who um, actually contacted me over this, and I appreciate appreciate that from Doug. Yeah, uh, and uh, he's invited me out to Moscow to uh, sit down, kind of like what you and I are doing here. And uh, I, I, this this operation I've had, I, I getting out to Mos Moscow from Atlanta, essentially airport to airport, eight hours. Mm -hmm. uh, I just can't, I can't sit that long. I have to, I have to get up, you know, almost like every 15, 20 minutes or so, and just walk around. Uh, and it's three days, it'll be three days out of my schedule. So I, I want to do what you and I are doing. I want to do this remotely. I'm waiting for them to go along with that. But I would be I would essentially be telling them the same thing I'm telling you right now. So you really kind of got an exclusive on this before Doug Wilson did. <laughs> I'm talking to him later in the year. I'll, I'll rub it in his face. Yeah. I sure I'll appreciate that. <laughs> um, so I guess, so you mentioned Acts 111, you mentioned Revelation 1, uh, whatever, 9. 10, one seven revelation one seven so so again my so i was saved in a church i was planted actually by, by macarthur's dad jack macarthur way back when and I was in the backyard of, of grace community church there of course very dispensationalist calvinist premillennial church right young earth creation like a whole thing and so that's kind of really most of California. <laughs> to, oh, sure. sure. Um, and I can say that as a native. It's most of the United States. I mean, it just, is. Just, it that's, is. Yeah. That's reality. And, and so, you know, I, it's one of those like even going to seminary, most guys in seminary weren't pre-mill and even would mock. Oh, there's some traditional pre-mill guys, but, you know, there's no dispensationalist. That's just goofy and stupid. A lot of guys were on mill and it's kind of like, ah, shrug. One professor, I think he called himself a pan mill jokingly. It'll yeah. all pan out, you know. But there was nobody who was post mill, you know, and of course you've said in others I've heard, uh, I don't really like the term. And frankly, I'm not, I'm not crazy about it either because we're talking about a millennium and is it going to happen or not? Are we in it now? Nah, eh. What about all these other prophecies? Are we waiting for something or is there a rapture? Isn't there, are there things let's and, and how are we living our life? I mean, cause frankly, I mean, for me, for the longest time, it was, it was waiting um, 
you know, for something to happen. And I think I still have some of that. I think a lot of people do. Oh, sure. Especially in America. It's only natural. It's only natural. Exactly. I, I and we think, and then, you know, if you're thinking that, you're not thinking about your great grandchildren, right? You already have grandchildren. So your right. great grandchildren aren't too far off. You might probably see them, right? And at least some of them. And I, my oldest is only 12. So I'm a ways from any of that. But to shift the focus of, Maybe have a kid, I guess, because that's what everybody else is doing or two, and that's it. It's it's now we're focusing on – cops are going to come get me. Sirens are going. Uh, I don't know if you can hear that. But if – are we focusing now on the past and looking at all this stuff and, oh, no, oh, should I do this? Should I do this? Should I – you know, we're always worried. Or, well, what did our ancestors do? What did our great-great-grandparents do? What, what were the, you know, Christians of two, three, four, five hundred years ago doing? And should we do that? Because frankly, the last hundred plus years has been horrible for, for the church, for culture, yeah. for society as a whole. Um, and so it's it's really changed me and my perspective, I would say. And if nothing else, I would say very thank you. And again, thank you for this talk, because, you know, I, I can't disagree with that in the sense of asking these questions, because there's certain verses that I have, you know, whether it's soteriology or even creation or ecclesiology or or things where. You know, well, women can preach now. And it's like, no, no, but well, yeah. And then you go, there, oh, okay, no, no, okay. You know, and there's certain things that people will just crop up because of culture, because of society, because of whatever. Um, it, it's fascinating. I guess some, you know, going to the literal literature, right? I like Acts 1. That's kind of one that's stuck in my mind. And maybe you can uh, elaborate on this. Of course, it says, you know, in verse 9, he says, as he said these things, as they were looking up, he, that is Jesus, was lifted into a cloud, took him out of their sight. So Jesus is there with the 12 or the 11. They pick Matthias, right? And there's probably other people there too. And Jesus is there, and then he gets lifted up. He goes away, physically there, resurrected body, and he disappears. Verse 10, while they were gazing into heaven, behold, two men stood by white, in white robes and said, verse 11, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taking up, taken up into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So for, to me, I mean, right off the bat, you read that and you think, okay, so Jesus is there and he says, adios. See you guys later. You know, I'm not going to partake. I mean, he even talks about the, the uh, communion Lord's table. I'm not going to partake until the consummation, etc. That's another verse, but he disappears and he's going to come back. These either angels or two messengers, whatever they are, two guys, probably angels. He's going to come back. So you're saying, is that, that coming back is, is that 80, 70? Is that, well, no, I'm, I'm, guys I'm, not, I'm, guys I'm not, I'm not saying that this is, this is the point that people are missing with this. Not that you're missing this because you, you and I talking for the first time here. Uh, I, I keep trying to tell people uh, someone can take this verse and offer a very good argument as to why it is not the second coming. Uh -huh. And and if, if you want to take this as a second coming passage, that's okay. But now you have to deal with someone like Milton Terry. Now, Milton Terry wrote uh, biblical hermeneutics and biblical apocalyptics. And in biblical hermeneutics, he has two long paragraphs discussing uh Acts chapter one, and Ken Gentry has, and uh, uh, Jay Rogers, I think, uh, reprinted his his commentary on Revelation, and so they like Ken Gentry. I mean, they they like Milton Terry, Ken Gentry, Jay Rogers, and dispensationalists. I mean, what was this? Robert Thomas, he was at the Master Seminary. I, he and I, we he oh, and I debated yeah. years I've, ago I've listened to that debate and he had he has he wrote an article on that and says you know Milton Terry is the is the hermeneutical standard and so when 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 I look at passages like this I actually do research mm -hmm. instead of me just looking at a passage and say here's what I think it means uh and and one of the things I do is I want to see what other people say and, and people say well Gary you know you're you've discovered something uh that how can you say you've discovered something that in 2000 years no one's ever discovered before? I, I've never said anything like that. But I just, <laughs> what, what I discover is, is that other people who I respect and other people respect have a different interpretation of this passage. 
And Milton Terry is one of them. He's got two pair. And he isn't the only one. I found others, too. If I had my notes here, I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd read it to you. But Milton Terry goes this idea that he will come in the same way or in like manner. And he goes to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Um, if I can find, let's see here. Verse 2 Timothy 3, verse 7. They're always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And just as Janus, and just as Janus and Jambers opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men of depraved mind rejected as regards the faith. So that phrase, just as, is the same phrase that's used in Acts chapter 1. It'll he'll come back in the in the same way, just as he left. But you you can't take the Janus and Jambres story and say, oh, everything that, that, that Paul is saying here about what was happening in his day, comparable to Janus and Jambres, happened in the same exact way that it happened uh, to, to in, in Moses' day with, with, with Aaron. And, and, and that's essentially Milton Terry's point here. He gives a couple of examples of that phraseology is used, and I don't have the other one at my fingertips here, about that phrase does not mean in the exact same way. Now, this is the book of Acts. So if you, if you use Matthew, Mark, and Luke three times, we find that Jesus is coming on the clouds before that generation passes away. That's the reference point here. Didn't Jesus, he was speaking to his disciples. He wasn't speaking to the air. He mm -hmm. was speaking to his disciples. The disciples asked him questions about this. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 26, verse 64, saying to Caiaphas, from now on, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And then, of course, Caiaphas says, whoa, whoa, wait a minute here. Uh, he, Jesus is identifying him, himself with, with, with God of the, of the Old Testament. Uh, so Milton Terry's point here is the language here does not necessarily refer to what we would call the second coming. He goes even further than that. He just says it doesn't refer to that. Yeah. So my, point, my point in all this is, that if you if you pick a verse like that, there needs to be some consistency on it. You need to deal with Milton Terry's argument. You need, need to deal with some other people who argue in the same way. I'm not saying that this, I'm not saying that this has to refer to AD 70. The whole point I've been saying is if you're going to point to a verse, keep in mind that there are other ver there are other people out there who disagree with you on this. Yeah. But there's no people don't disagree within the Christian community. No one is disagreeing with you. Uh, Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary or he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, uh, died and was buried and rose on the third day. There's no di people don't disagree with with those types of things. And this just comes directly from the Bible. Mm -hmm. and so that the, when it talks about you know coming uh, and coming again uh, with glory to judge both the, the quick and the dead. There are lots of passages there that seem to seem to apply to events of that generation, not necessarily a second coming. Um, so that's all I've been trying to do. And I have been somewhat misrepresented on this because mm -hmm. I keep I keep bringing this argument. up. I'll give you another one. Uh, if you go to Daniel, Daniel, chapter 12, and this is, and this is this is on on the resurrection Daniel chapter 12. I'll read this to you and your listeners and, and your viewers and make a determination. What, what does this mean? Now, at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands over the sons of your people, will arise and there will be a time of distress, which uh, such as never before occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, every. Uh, that your people, everyone who is found written in the book of life, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, those to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Now, if you, if you pick up the typical commentary on this, they would say this is the general resurrection at the end of history. Mm -hmm. And I know this. And how do I know this? It's because I actually do and read, read what other people say. Mm -hmm. But Ken Gentry takes a completely different position and says this, Jesus is describing what was taking place in the lead up to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 and the Great Tribulation. And this is Ken Gentry saying that. And, and I, 
you know, people have been pointing pointing this out to Ken, and he has an article on it. I'm not making any of this up. He's got it online uh, that he does not apply this to the general resurrection. But most people, I think, would apply to the general resurrection. And people come to me and say, "You're friends with Ken Gentry. Why? Why does? Why isn't he consistent here uh, with this particular passage? Why isn't he consistent with Revelation chapter one verse seven and his and, and Ken Gentry's upcoming?" commentary on Revelation, uh, Ken spends more than 20 pages defending uh, Revelation 1-7, every eye will see him as referring to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And, Interesting. And when you point this out to people, they'll, they'll say, well, then, oh, what are you, a full preterist now? No, it doesn't say I'm a full preterist. All I'm just saying is there are a lot of people out there who are questioning the partial preterist view. They're using the same hermeneutic that you guys are using, and they're wondering why, why, why you aren't consistent with this. Mm -hmm. That's what they're asking. And those guys won't respond. I've, I've kind of mediated this. I'm asking the same questions. Yeah. And I, you know, and the, the, the best way to get rid of me is to describe me as a heretic. You know, mm. that's, you know, I'm, I'm okay with that. I just think it's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know if there's anything in scripture where it says you have to believe that Acts one, you know, Acts chapter one, verse 11 refers to a physical coming of Jesus at the end of history. I don't yeah. see that written in any creed anywhere. Um, and, and, you know, so, so some, you know, if, 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 if I didn't read, if, if I didn't tell you that Ken Gentry said that, and if I were to ask you, ask you, what do you think Ken Gentry thinks of, of Daniel chapter 12 verses one, two, and three, and you read it and say, well, well, obviously this is referring to the general resurrection at the end of history, but he doesn't take that position. And actually, um, gotcha. um, Jim Jordan in his commentary on Daniel lists six different interpretations of Daniel chapter 12, verses one through three, six, six different interpretations there. Huh. Wow. Um, and uh, he lays them all. He des describes each one of them. By, by the way, his, we're reprinting his book. It's, it's on delivery. We'll probably get it, get it this coming week. So six different interpretations of, 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 of the passage. Of he goes through each one of them and he says, this can't be this because of this. And then he goes and he explains, this is why it is, and it has to be this and so forth. Hmm. But if you were to pick up the typical Bible commentary, they would say, no, no, this is a general resurrection at the end of history. And so people say, what, what am I going to do? I, I, yeah. I look to King Gentry as an authority <laughs> on this, and he's taking a, a, basically a preterist position on it. So it's yeah. real. A lot of people are confused. And these are, look, I met, I, I, I meet with people and people email me literally from all over the world. These are, these are, solid Christian people. And you got people out there uh, who, who blast these people and consign them to hell because they're, they don't believe, uh, uh, they're not convinced in terms of the, the type of arguments that are used to, 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 vent, to defend a particular eschatological position. Yeah. And I just, I just think, that's, I think that's horrible to do that. Yeah. Just, you know, you look, justification by faith uh, you believe all that. You believe all the basic elements of the Christian faith, and you say, "Well, I, I you know, I, I got a di difference of opinion on the second coming, um, and in other and, and other things, and I'm, I'm going to hell because of that." I believe in the resurrection of the dead. Uh, someone says, "But I believe when you die, you get a new body. Uh, then you don't have to wait. You know, when Jesus returns at the end of history, you get yeah. it right right then and there. So you get a new model uh, right then and there. It's yeah. the same result." You 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 to you know to die is uh, is, is to live as Christ to, to die is gain. Yeah, believe in the resurrection of the dead is what the with what the creed says. I believe that. Now the Apostles' Creed says the resurrection of the body, but the New Testament doesn't say anything about the resurrection of the body. It talks about the resurrection of the dead. But if you want to make that a synonym for the for the body, I don't have any problem with that. Hmm. But don't then go and blast people and consign them to hell if they still believe in the resurrection of the dead. And they believe that you're going to have a real a body, just like the body that's described in in um, uh, Second Corinthians five and first uh, and First Corinthians fifteen. That's what this debate is all about. You know, you have to be so rigidly uh, in tune with their system without any questioning. And if you don't, if you're not, you're considered a heretic, and you're going to hell when you die. Yeah. Um, I want to ask about the the last part of revelation um in a minute 
I'm curious what you what is your now that you're a, a newly minted heretic it seems like uh by some anyway what would you because there's there's guys he's down in your neck of the woods and guys like andy stanley you know or the stephen oh, furtick or yeah. a lot of these you know flashy or i mean stanley's quite kind of nerdy to be totally honest but you know they're very slick they got these big churches and they just you know we should unhitch the old testament from the new Testament. Well, yeah jesus and they seem to be making either apologies all the time about the gospel about the exclusivity of christ about morality about same-sex marriage whatever um or just making it all cool and it's charismatic -y and you know clapping and it's great uh i would say and i kind of make distinction between somebody who's a false teacher and someone who's a heretic, what would you say? Is that really a, a fair distinction to say somebody's like, maybe they're teaching falsely, maybe they don't really know or something like that. And then there's like degrees or what, what's your. Yeah, I, I, again, uh, you, I think you could call, say someone is a false teacher um, and, and a, her, a heretic is really, you know, I'm not even sure if that word is legitimate. People throw it around, you know, for, you know, for anyway. I, I, I could take the same parameters on eschatology that my Reformed brothers do and apply it to dispensationalism and call that heretical. Mm. I mean, if you sat down and, and looked at all of the, the basic doctrines of dispensationalism, uh, and put put the same standard to it as you would uh, for you know qu asking questions about the you know the second coming and so forth. It, it, it would be it would be considered heresy. Mm -hmm. uh, two two different peoples of God. Two you know uh, uh, set, you know, splitting up the sixty nine this you know sixty nine weeks of years from the seventieth week, uh, putting the prophetic clock on on hold, um, redefining what an antichrist is. Um, uh, the, the the teaching the rapture of the church. I mean, you know, they don't believe. Think about that. The dispensationalists do not believe First Thessalonians four is about the second coming. They right. believe in something called the rapture. Right. Uh, and so, if someone if someone doesn't believe that the if, that uh, someone has a different opinion of First Thessalonians chapter four and says it doesn't apply to the second coming, you can't call them a heretic unless you call the dispensationalists a heretic because mm -hmm. they don't believe it either. And so if you're pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, pre-wrath, you're taking all those pa all those passages, uh, verses in 1 Thessalonians 4, you're not applying to the second coming. You you would be considered a heretic. But there's kind of this unstated <clears throat> contract between dispensationalists <laughs> and non-dispensationalists where because they're real popular, they have big churches and so forth and so on. They would never call them heretics. Now, the if you put them in a small group and you would find some people in the reform community would in fact call a dispensationalist heretics, but generally speaking, they don't do that. RC Sproul didn't call uh, John MacArthur a heretic. We had him right. speak at his conference, even though John MacArthur's eschatology was way, way different from, from, from Sproul's. You, right. you got, you have five different interpretations of an entire book of the Bible, the book of revelation. Think of that. You can have a, you, you can't say that about any other book of the Bible, but you can't say that about Revelation. And we, we allow it. We allow five different interpretations of the book of Revelation, and none of them is, is a heretic who holds one of, those, one of those five things. So I think the word heretic is just overused. It's too simple. Mm. And the, the people who are throwing it around haven't done much study, haven't done what I've done. I've looked at this stuff. I've compared. I've done all these comparisons, and I get these emails and people on Facebook all the time. And I want to say to them, why should I do my, the research for you? Go and do it for, do it for yourself. <laughs> yeah. Um, they don't, they've never looked to see what other people have said about a particular passage. They just sure. assume this has got to teach this. Um, in fact, I've got this, um, I think it's by Moses Stewart. Oh, this, this was interesting. Moses Stewart wrote a two volume commentary on the book of revelation, conservative guy. Um, and here's what he writes. This is from a uh, this is from a book. It's a, the following are extracts from notes by Professor Stewart to his edition of Arnesti's Elements of Interpretation. So it's a book on hermeneutics, and he's got notes in it uh, that he, he he put in it. I think it was translated. Uh, and this is what he says. 
in very many cases, the first thing has been to study theology, basically systematic theology. The second, to read the Bible in order to find proofs of what has already been adopted as matter of belief. Mm. And I think we do that a lot. You know, yeah. I've got, I have this doctrine, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go look for the passages that support it, ignore the ones that don't support it, or reinterpret the ones that I think are a real problem. And look, both sides have that same problem. Yeah, We're looking for text to support an already developed theology. Uh, so uh, anyway, I'm, tr I'm, I'm trying to, you know, get this out on the table. And I, part of the problem with the people I'm dealing with they're in denominations where they they have uh, taken an oath to uphold the Westminster Confession of Faith. Yeah. Well, I'm not an I'm not an officer in the church. I, I'm I'm not I'm not bound by the Westminster Confession of Faith. And you can still take exceptions to the Westminster Confession of Faith. You have to let them know ahead of time when you're doing this. But you know they're they're stuck. They they can't budge an inch on all this. I can, and because I'm budging, and pushing them a little bit, you know it's gotten me into trouble. Yeah. I'm a big boy. I can handle it. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good. Well, I appreciate you clearing that up. <clears throat> it was, yeah, I got a few messages a while back from different people. It was like, wait, what? Gary DeMar, Gary DeMar? Like, what? <laughs> you know, I mean, obviously we all have, you know, friends and favorites and, you know, and favorite scholars from the past. And, you know, sometimes sure. something said or, or we realize, oh, he believed that or something. Uh, that's why a lot, a lot of times I like dead guys because they're already done and they're not going to fall yeah. into you know, <laughs> adultery or some stupid thing. Um, so I guess <clears throat> for my own curiosity, and we'll, we'll, we'll close with this, but I see, so Revelation, obviously uh, you take an earlier view, you think what, 66, 67, something yeah, like that? Yeah, and I, I, I'm, not a, I, that's, I'm not an expert on the, on the book of Revelation, I, and, uh, but I, I do take an early date. Uh, but I couldn't give you a specific date, and I'm not real sure anybody could give you an exact date. Uh, but I think it's pretty obvious that the book of Revelation was written before the destruction of Jerusalem that took place in AD 70. And again, okay. it's Ken Gentry's position. It was Greg Bonson's position. Uh, there are a lot, it's position of a lot of guys. Moses Stewart, in fact, I just quoted. He takes an, he takes an early date in the book of Revelation. Yeah. Um, and it, it makes a difference, obviously, if you do that. Uh, if you take a late date and it hasn't happened yet, that means everything from chapter four onward hasn't happened yet. Right. And people can Which say, is then they kind of add all this other stuff and pull yeah, from this yeah. place and that place and Daniel yeah. and Thessalonians and all that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so at the end, and like you said, you're not an expert in Revelation. I'm not either. I need to study it more than I, I have, really. But... I've got, I got it up here. Revelation, there's 22 chapters, 21. And I know the headings are not inspired, right. but it says all, all things made new. So verse one of chapter 21 says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the further first earth have passed away. So to me that, okay, there's a big distinction. There's a marked difference, something that we see the heaven and the earth. We see this at the beginning of, you know, the Bible, Genesis one, one, the same type of language. Uh, also, there was no more sea. Then I saw John. Then I, John, saw the whole city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from heaven, saying, "Behold, the tabernacle of God is with wit, with men, and He will dwell with them. They shall be His people. God Himself will be with them and be their God. And He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There shall be no more pain." For the former things have passed away. So that's all quotations, or most of it is. So right there, to me, it's like, and I know you're you're more asking the question because, you know, just for everybody's sake, um, basically, you're you're saying Ken Gentry is still a partial preterist, still thinks there's a second coming, but a lot of the second coming passages that a lot of people point to, like in Acts one, for example, he takes that as applying to AD seventy and not the second. Well, coming. no, Gentry would take Acts chapter one and apply that to the second coming. Oh, he does. Okay. It's Milton, it's Milton Terry, Terry. who okay. Ken Gentry likes and uses and so forth, who, who says it does not apply there. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, so, but it, there's a lot of partial. So you're saying, hey, guys, partial preterist guys. Great. Cool. But <laughs> you're saying this means this when it really should mean this. And then you met and you're inconsistent over here and you're inconsistent. That's basically your gist. You're trying to get 
a consensus and a in a, a focused uh flow right and, and just like interpreting yeah, things. Look, I, I would say all all of these guys would agree uh on those basic things in the in in the Nicene Creed about uh, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, and so forth. Because there's individual verses that actually say that. Right. There is a verse in there that talks about the coming of the Lord, but all partial preterists take coming of the Lord as, you know, a lot of that applies to AD 70. The question is, if you believe in a second coming, and I'm not saying I don't believe in a second coming as it's typically understood, uh, but someone would say, oh, okay, but which ones apply consistently? Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's 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 the rub. Now you bring up, you bring up math, uh, Matthew chapter, well, uh, Revelation twenty one and twenty two. Yeah, and it uh, comes down to the definition of of uh, new heavens and new earth. Mm -hmm. uh, and and we have to we have to keep in mind that the book of Revelation is a book of signs. What you are reading in the book of Revelation, like in chapter 19, it says uh, he's coming He's coming with a, on a white horse and a sword coming out of his mouth and say, mm -hmm. wait, wait a minute, is that the second coming? Uh, uh, well, maybe in symbolic form, or mm -hmm. if that's AD 70, is it, is we say that's in, some, in symbolic form. Um, and so you've, you've, you've got something like that. But in Ma look at Ma Matthew chapter five, um, Matthew chapter five, verse 17. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. This is Jesus. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of the law shall pass away uh, from the law until all is fulfilled. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and so teaches others shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever keeps and teaches uh, these shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So, so Jesus uses this idea of until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law. Now, if this is referring to the physical heavens and earth in the future, then what do you do with the fact that it says not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law? Is that if, if, if the, uh, the heavens and earth passing away here refers to the physical heavens and earth at the end of history, how then are we still every jot and tittle of the law we have to abide by today? Mm. And, and John Brown, who wrote it, there's a three volume work on the um, discourses and sayings of our Lord, uh, and he, he has a commentary on that, and he said, this is not referring to the physical heavens and earth, this is referring to uh, the, the, the old covenant as heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. So you got, you got John Brown who believes that, you got John Owen who believes that, you got John Lightfoot who believes that, and you have others who believe the same thing. And you have Ken Gentry who believes that, mm -hmm. because in, in Revelation chapter 21, he believes that the new heavens and the new earth that's our, our, this, that Jesus, Jesus is speaking of here is follows the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. He does not see this as the second, as the, the physical heavens and earth at the, at the end of history. Hmm. And when he debated, when he debated Tommy Ice on the, on the, the great tribulation book that was published by Craigle, Tommy Ice ca called him on this. He said, Ken, you're, you're saying here that the new heavens and the new earth have already taken place yet after the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And, and Ken never answered it. Yeah. So again, people are saying, wait a minute. <laughs> so Ken Gentry now believes Revelation chapter 21 and 22 don't refer to the physical new heavens and uh, new earth in, in the future, but it refers to events after AD 70. Hmm. Uh and then, you, then you've got Ken Gentry who takes – the reason I'm bringing Ken up in all this is because he's, he's the go-to guy in dealing, in dealing with me on all this. Mm. And, um, and, and so I know that. Okay. then you go to 2 Peter chapter 3 about the new heavens and the new earth and I'll be all burned up and so forth and so on. And yet, yet Ken says that is actually the burning up the physical heavens and earth. But Doug Wilson doesn't see it that way. So –
so you, you you see what I'm getting at here. I'm yeah. trying to get I'm trying to get this worked out, but they don't want to do it uh, because it's too difficult for them to explain given the position that they've taken. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I'm, unfortunately I'm the, you know, I'm the, 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 the person who's kind of at the, I'm the point man on all this and it's easy to attack me on it because they won't deal with these particular passages consistently. And I, I've done, a, I've done five uh, podcasts on this where I go through everything I've go gone through with you, all these different passages. And I've taken all these guys and I've, I've, I've shown how inconsistent they are with these various scripture passages. Mm. Um, so anyway, so yeah. that's, that's what this is all about. Okay. That's good. I mean, I, I, and obviously, I mean, I know you're, you're more pushing back and basically it seems like you're caught in the crossfire of he's saying this about this and then this, but he's saying something different and we're all in this together. We want to understand the scripture. Yeah, and, and, people, and new and new people. So, so people read my book, my books, and they read Ken Gentry's books and they say, Oh, wait a minute. I'm reading Ken Gentry over here and I'm looking at this passage over here. I'm, I'm using the same hermeneutic. And he says this is AD 70, but over here he says it's the second coming. And yeah. yet a lot of people say this is the second coming, and he says it's AD 70. And yeah. I, I get the questions, and I'm willing to sit down and 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 work with them on this to, to, to work them through it. Um, and I keep telling people, you know, you 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 can you can push me out of the way, but I'm, I'm guaranteeing you people are still asking these questions. I got yeah. I, I mentioned I get letters from people all over the world. I got one a good friend of mine, seminary graduate, RTS. He said, Gary, you know, I've been I've, I've been asking these same questions for years. And I got pastors who will tell me I've, I've asked these same questions, but I can't say anything about it because I'd lose my pastorate. Hmm. It, it, guys have lost their pastorate wow. just being partial preterists. Really? So, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, I got a good friend out in California. He said, oh, Gary, you don't remember. I, I lost my, my my pulpit because I was a, I was a partial preterist. So. Wow. This is this is this is big this is big stuff, and yet you can make a case. Partial preterism is very easy to make a case for. I mean, it's yeah, it's really simple. It's those it's those kind of verses in between that are difficult. Hmm. And when you bring them up, they say, "No, no, just agree, just agree with us on this because this is the church has agreed with these these things on this." And I'm saying, you guys can't even agree on this. <laughs> so why should, why should other people say why should I believe the church on this because they can't agree either I go yeah. back I go back through all these find all these things this what these guys teach and it's it's, it's remarkable but anyway yeah no that's good and uh, again we could get into real deep into the weeds um yeah I, I definitely jury's still out on in my mind I mean I see you know there's no more death no more sorrow no more crying and I look around, there's a lot. <laughs> and so yeah, it's like, well, are we spiritualizing it and, and how much? I don't think we're spiritualizing it at all. I believe what, what you're describing here is this new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. Uh -huh. And if you go to Hebrews chapter 12, you go to Galatians chapter 4, it says we should be fixed on the Jerusalem above, on Zion above. That's, that's where our fix is, our fixation is. And so when it, said, when it says this, when the, con the, the the basis of the new Jerusalem, the the the, um, the 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 new heavens and the new earth in the sense of the new covenant, those things do in fact pass away. When you when when you die, there's there's no more judgment. There's there's no more death. I mean, I, I believe that the that the the last the, the last death is not physical death. It's spiritual death. Yeah. Uh, that, that that's that's the true death because Jesus says in in um, John chapter eleven to Martha. Uh, you know, he says, I'm the resurrection of life. If, if you believe in me, you, you will, you will never die. Yeah. He can't be talking about physical death there because we all physically die. Yeah. And so by pulling a lot of these different things together, you, you come to more of a covenantal understanding. I don't think it's spiritualizing at all because you got all kinds of things in the book of revelation that, you know, we got dragons, you got, uh, you got mention of Jezebel. You got mention of, of Sodom and Egypt. You got Babylon mentioned. Uh, you, you've got all of these. Uh, you know this giant woman. 
you got you know a third of the stars fall, fall fall from heaven and yet nothing happens to the earth right think of that in in, in uh, revelation 6 a third of the stars fall to the earth and yet nothing physically happens to the earth and and uh, second second uh, corinthians 5 17 uh if you're in christ you are a new uh, you're a new creation all things have passed away all things become new but you and i are new creations but you haven't changed physically you've just gotten older yeah. The same with me. I'm, I'm, I'm getting older, but yet I'm still a new, I'm still a new creation in, in Christ. Uh, and so we don't, are we spiritualizing that? No, I think it's, I think it's the fundamental reality that we're actually acknowledging in this case. And what I think it's the say, same thing. What would you say then though, with the dragon and the woman in space and this and this and this, like things you just said in revelation, if they're not, you know, because again, oh, I just take the Bible literally, you know, that's why I'm a literalist. You know, people will say that millennial thousand years. OK, except for all the other things that aren't literal, like the woman in space. What would you say that then if it, if that's not a spiritual thing and if much of Revelation or maybe all of Revelation is talking about AD 70, what's the woman in space then? <laughs> I, 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 mean, I, I Instead of you, I don't like using the word spiritual. I like the word symbolic. It's symbol. okay. okay. Revelation okay. says this is. Uh, this is about signs. It's yeah. signage. That's that's the word that's used. These are signs. And so you, you look and you say, okay, this there's a woman. She gives birth, uh, tw 12 stars, sun and moon. And you say, where else in scripture do we find that? You've, you've heard me probably say this before. You go all the way back to uh, Genesis chapter 37, mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, you know, Joseph says, what does he have? He has the sun, the moon. And 11 stars bowing down to him. And you say, well, wait a minute, it's not the real, real you know, sun, moon, and stars. It's the, the sun, moon, and stars represent, represent him, his wife, and his children. Mm -hmm. And so that's pulled, that's pulled over into the New Testament. And that same language is used, is used again. You have this woman who's gonna who's giving birth. Uh, is she giving giving birth to the new new covenant Israel? Uh, the sun, moon, and stars. She's lifted. See, in this case, you see, you see, sun, moon, and stars lifted up, uh, bright, and so forth. But in the Old Testament, if sun, moon, and stars, sun and moon go dark and stars fall, that's a sign of judgment. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, it's look, it, it takes some talent to do this. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying this is easy, but um, I, I think it's quite simplistic to say, well, I. I, everybody, you know, we have to interpret Book of Revelation literally. But even Hal Lindsey, even Hal Lindsey admitted, no one really interprets the, Bible, the, the Book of Revelation literally. But mm -hmm. they do, they do do it if you turn do it in terms of its literature. And how do you know what the literature is in the Book of Revelation? The reason, the way you know about it is to go back to the Old Testament, and there are probably. I've, I've seen as the number is 400 or so different allusions to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. Wow. Uh, so you've got to read it in terms of that Old Testament, that, that Old Testament script. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, uh, Babylon is judged. You know, he talks about sun, moon, and, and, and so forth going dark. And that type of language, you know, describes the, the judgment on nations. So anyway, no, it's not good. easy. So, no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. But it's it's good to ask the questions and push back and try and at least get a consistent understanding sure. Of, sure. of the scripture and, and how we interpret it and so on. Um, no, that's really good. Yeah. I mean, I guess. I don't know. Philosophically, philosophically, I would at least say not biblically necessarily, but there was a time when there was nothing. Right. God is the uncreated God and he decided to create. So I would lean back at least and say, well, there would there seems to be because there's a linear, there's movies, books, life and death, right? That there's a time, there will be a time that he will uncreate everything. Um, of course, you know, there's a yeah, I'm, that. I'm not sure that's the case. Uh, okay. uh, we're in the new covenant. Uh, and I, I don't, you know, the, 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 the created order didn't sin. We right. sinned and brought it down with us. And we're the one you mentioned earlier about, you know, times long ago. What is rep, what is representative? What is still standing today uh, in Europe that even even survived 
World War II. Those cathedrals. Cathedrals, yeah. You see those, those, I don't know if we could build those today. Right. And I think it was a very narrow focus of that. But I think that the, the latent talent and gifts that God has given us have a trans, transformative uh, uh, result in the world. Look, look what you and I are doing here right now. I mean, what, who, who ever would have thought of this? I, I'm, I have a, a science fiction writer, Wilson Tucker, uh, read most of, his, most of his novels when I was a teenager. And he was talking about the year 2000 and so forth. He says, one, one of the things that uh, science fiction writers never came up with was email. Hmm. Even when people were in space, they were still using paper for, for, for stuff. <laughs> And you know, look look what's happened. And people see this as the work of the devil. I mean, this this was the people say, oh, there's all this technology and so forth. This is this is satan, Satan's way. Now, what are you what are you giving credit to Satan for? <laughs> you know, yeah. the, re the reason we have the telephone today, one of the reasons we have a telephone today, was by because of Samuel uh, F, uh, F. B. Morris. He developed Morse code. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a Christian. He was a, a brilliant painter. Uh, he, he gets a tell he got, he gets a, a letter from, uh, someone about his wife was sick. And, uh, by the time he gets home to, you know, to see what was going on, she was dead and buried. Wow. So he sits down and says, this is, we got to change this thing. And so he wow. develops, you know, the telegraph, uh, you know, I just, I just, I don't think God has to destroy something in order to re, re, rebuild it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, and, and, and look, he might, I don't think he has to. I don't think there's any place in scripture where he says that's what's going to happen unless you, you take second Peter chapter three. But again, a lot of people disagree on that. That's really the, the, the word that's used the Greek word is stoicheia elements. And it doesn't mean the, the elements of the periodic table. It means that means the elementary principles uh, that are used. And they can mm -hmm. be either elementary secular, covenantal, uh, or, or, or new covenant principles. The word itself is kind of neutral, but it does not mean the you know atoms and, and so forth and so on. Huh. Uh, so again, all I'm calling for here, and others have as well, is look, let's look at this stuff again without calling people heretics. Yeah. Yeah, no, it kind of dissuades the argument and kind of moves it off. Well, he's a, he's a heretic, so we're not yeah. going to deal with that anymore. We don't have to think about this anymore. Yeah, that's a good point. No, this is great. Um, I, again, I really appreciate it. Um, what would you say for those listening? They want to not really heard you before. Or, hey, this is kind of interesting, this whole different view uh, of eschatology and all that. What's something that they should pick up, one or two? three titles that you would recommend well, the, the, the the simplest book say on matthew 24 would be is jesus coming soon okay uh, it's not a very big book i don't want to burden people with a whole lot of you know a lot to have to read if you want something much more in depth last day's madness i still cover matthew 24 and 25 in there um if you want just something a very comprehensive study of matthew 24 actually parts of 23 and 24 is um, uh, my book, Wars Wars and Rumors of Wars. These can all be gotten at AmericanVision.org, AmericanVision.org. We have a commentary by Jim Jordan uh, on Matthew 23, 24, and 25. Uh, it's just called that, Matthew 23 slash 25. Mm -hmm. John Bray has a book. He takes more of a historical study of Matthew 24. It's just called Matthew 24, fulfilled, Matthew 24, fulfilled. And I've got other books on eschatology online, but again, is Jesus coming soon? Last Day's Madness, Wars and Rumors of Wars, Jim Jordan's um, Matthew 23 to 25, and John Bray's Matthew 24 Fulfilled. Those, those will get you started. Yeah. Um, and if Perfect. you have, I always tell people, if you have questions after reading these books, you know, you can contact me. But I don't, I don't answer people uh, if the answer is in a book. <laughs> yeah. And the reason for that is, is because I got to keep answering the same thing over and over again. And one of the reasons I wrote the book is so I don't have to keep doing that. And people say, right. oh, yeah, so you can make money <laughs> on these books. I don't get a dime. I don't get a penny in royalties on any of these books that I, I write. Mm. So you're not you're not enriching me uh, by by getting any of them. Uh, and I, you know, 
I've never heard anybody send something back to me and say, well, this is just, I just can't go along with this at all. Yeah. I think I make a pretty good case. I make a biblical case. Uh, if you're, if you, if you'd like to be challenged and, you know, take you through the Bible on it, those are the books I would get. Yeah, no, that's great. I appreciate it, Gary. Thank you uh, so much. I mean, it's, it's, um, it means a lot. So again, I've, like I said, I've learned a lot in the last couple of years and there's still much, much to oh, do. Yeah. Much to learn. So yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot to learn. I'm learning I, through this whole controversy. I've learned a whole lot more. It's, and I'm actually more <laughs> convinced, convinced in my questioning than I've been before because I, I find things uh, that I've never, I've never seen before. Yeah. The internet has just made it much easier to find things that uh, go back hundreds of years it's amazing the same type of debate that we're having today. Much of it was taking place a long time ago. Yeah. And, There's nothing new under the sun, right? Nothing new. Yeah. Well, Richard, I appreciate you having me on yeah. and letting me uh, kind of lay out my, uh, what, what the deal is here. And, uh, but this is, it's been the same thing I've been, I've been saying all along. Yeah. No, it's been great. I appreciate you coming on it. Thank you so much. All right. Yeah. Thanks. All right, y'all. God bless. Thanks.